Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a nice summer day, and please remember to keep your mics muted. Today, the Secretary General launched his policy brief on COVID-19 in the urban world. The brief says that urban areas are at the epicenter of the pandemic, accounting for an estimated 90% of cases. The brief notes that the pandemic has, ex uh, has exposed deep inequalities in how people live in cities, with the pandemic impacting those who are already vulnerable, such as people living in slums and those without access to open public services near their homes. However, the brief says that because cities are hubs of resilience and ingenuity, the residents have quickly adapted to new ways of working and functioning and have demonstrated extraordinary solidarity. The brief makes a series of recommendations to tackle the inequalities in cities, including engaging with marginalized groups, avoiding disruptions of essential services, supporting local businesses, and including climate-friendly plans in their recovery. Last night, the Secretary General launched his Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. The group will build on the outcome of last year's Youth Climate Summit and provide young people with the opportunity to be part of the decision-making process. In a video message, the Secretary General said that we have seen young people on the front lines of climate action, showing us what bold leadership looks like, and that the new group will provide perspectives, ideas, and solutions that will help scale up climate action. And my guest today, the Secretary General's Special Advisor on Climate Action, Selwyn Hart, will tell you more about this new advisory group. Martin Griffiths, the Special Envoy for Yemen, informed the Security Council by VTC this morning about the progress of negotiations that have been ongoing for four months between the Yemeni parties. He said that both parties have provided feedback on various drafts and proposals, but they have yet to reach agreement on a final text. Mr. Griffith said that it is important that both parties continue to engage in the process, that the negotiations must be concluded before the window of opportunity closes. He warned that the military situation has not improved over the past month. The special envoy noted that at the beginning of this month, Ansar Allah confirmed in writing that they would authorize a long-planned UN-supervised technical mission to the FSO Safer Tanker. However, he added, we are still awaiting the permissions necessary for this team to deploy. Mark Lowcock, the emergency relief coordinator, warned that the humanitarian crisis in Yemen has never been worse. He told the council that famine is again on the horizon, conflict is again escalating, the economy is again in tatters, and humanitarian agencies are again nearly broke. Meanwhile, COVID-19 is spreading out of control. He said that there are now 43 active front lines in Yemen, compared to 33 in January. Yemenis need a nationwide ceasefire, Mr. Lokok said. This morning, the Security Council also unanimously voted to extend the sanctions regime in the Central African Republic for one year. It extended the mandate of the peacekeeping mission on Cyprus for six months and adopted a presidential statement related to the UN Office for, Western, for West Africa and the Sahel. I was asked yesterday about the activities of the UN Interim Force in Lebanon, or UNIFIL, during yesterday's incident along the Blue Line. I can say that the UNIFIL Head of Mission and Force Commander, Major General Stefano Del Col, was immediately in contact with Israel Defense Forces and Lebanese Armed Forces in order to contain the situation, decrease tension, and restore the cessation of hostilities. At this time, calm is returned to the area and UNIFIL is maintaining its presence on the ground. UNIFIL has launched an investigation to determine the facts and circumstances of the incident. Turning to Sudan, our humanitarian colleagues say that they are extremely concerned about the situation in Darfur, where a recent escalation of violence in different parts of the region has led to the loss of lives and livelihoods as well as forcing people to flee their homes. Reports say that there have been several serious incidents in South, West, and North Darfur states in recent weeks that have left several villages and houses burned, markets and shops looted, and infrastructure damaged. Aid organizations are working with the government to assess the impact of the clashes and determine what assistance is needed. And the UN African Union mission, UNAMID, notes with deep concern the recent increases in violent attacks on peaceful protesters civilians, rural communities, and camps of internally displaced persons in various localities in North, South, and West Darfur. The mission condemns the loss of life, injuries, and displacement resulting from such attacks, whose main victims are women and children. It calls on the relevant government authorities to apprehend the perpetrators and bring them to justice. 
The Secretary General's Acting Special Representative for Libya, Stephanie Williams, has announced the finalization of the process to initiate an international audit of the two branches of the Central Bank of Libya. The international financial review process is a critical step towards enhancing transparency in the Libyan financial system and creating the conditions for the eventual unification of the Central Bank of Libya. The process is equally important to have an informed dialogue on the equitable equitable distribution of national revenue in Libya and to re-establish national accountability mechanisms. We have some updates on the response to COVID-19 in our peacekeeping missions. UN mission in South Sudan, UNMIS, reports that in an effort to alleviate health concerns in Wau Central Prison, peacekeepers recently donated medications, face masks, soaps, sanitary napkins, and clothes to the prison's wing for female inmates. Meanwhile, the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, or MINUSMA, is protecting civilians in the Mopti region. More than 200 security patrols have been carried out by United Nations police since the start of the pandemic in the region. UN police are also delivering hand-washing kits and t-shirts with educational messages on ways to stop the spread of the virus. And in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the UN mission, MONUSCO, continues to sensitize actors on responding to COVID-19 in a way that aligns fully with the country's human rights commitments. For example, in Bunia, in Ituri province, the mission hosted a three-day workshop on the guiding principles of human rights to security, judicial, and health authorities, as well as to representatives of the local media and civil society. The International Organization for Migration said today that three Sudanese migrants were killed and two others injured in a shooting in the Qums disembarkation point last night in Libya after being intercepted at sea and returned to shore by the Coast Guard. The shooting occurred after more than 70 people were disembarked from a vessel. Staff from the IOM and Qums said that local authorities started shooting when the migrants attempted to escape from the disembarkation point. The injured migrants were transferred to local hospitals while survivors were moved to detention. The UN Refugee Agency deplored the tragic loss of lives and called for an urgent investigation following the shooting. Since the beginning of the year, in the Sahel and Lake Chad region, a growing number of refugees and displaced people have died after hitting landmines or improvised explosive devices. The UN Refugee Agency is calling for stronger efforts to mitigate the risks posed by these devices. While it appears that the primary targets are security forces, more and more civilians are indiscriminately killed and maimed. Chad and Nigeria top the most affected countries in the Lake Chad Basin, but UNHCR teams on the ground also witness a rising trend in the Sahel. The agency says that in addition to the death toll, injuries, and their after effects, the presence of explosive devices hinders access to local livelihoods as well as community infrastructure. They also affect the delivery of humanitarian aid and development activities. The UN humanitarian chief, Mark Lowcock, has, received, has released $100 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund, otherwise known as SURF, to urgently boost humanitarian response in 10 underfunded emergencies in Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and the Americas. The allocation, which places a strong emphasis on mitigating and responding to gender-based violence, will help frontline aid groups deliver life-saving assistance to extremely vulnerable people, as well as support programs that assist, address general greater needs due to COVID-19. The largest single allocation of $35 million was granted to Yemen, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. The rest of the funds will be distributed among relief organizations in Afghanistan, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Colombia, Haiti, Mozambique, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Uganda. So far this year, $225 million have been released as part of SERF's underfunded emergencies to support crisis response in 20 countries. This is the highest annual amount ever provided in the fund's history. More details are available online. Today, our UN teams in Brazil, Colombia, and Peru have issued a joint statement calling for increased support and response efforts in the Amazon region as COVID-19 continues to rage in the area. The pandemic is also impacting hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. The UN teams warned that the situation of approximately 170,000 people living in remote areas along the Amazon River on the border between Brazil, Colombia, and Peru is of particular concern. As a result of the pandemic, and despite the efforts deployed by the three governments to respond to the crisis, there are growing fears over the ability of health institutions to cope with the situation and save lives. We're working with national and local authorities to boost support for indigenous populations in the Amazon region. 
the Pan American Health Organization is increasing hospital and testing capacity, and the UN teams are distributing personal protective equipment and food, as well as disseminating prevention campaigns in indigenous languages. Despite these efforts, response capacities remain limited in the area. Funding shortages are significantly hampering the crucial life-saving response. The World Tourism Organization said today that the near-complete lockdown imposed in response to the pandemic led to a 98% fall in international tourist numbers in May when compared to 2019. The latest edition of the World Tourism Barometer shows a 56% year-on-year drop in tourist arrivals between January and May. This translates into a fall of 300 million tourists and $320 billion lost in international tourism receipts, which is more than three times the loss during the great economic crisis of 2009. And I am delighted to announce that the Solomon Islands has paid its regular budget dues in full. We are now at 107 fully paid up member states. And uh, that is it for me. Uh, And uh, once you're done with me, we will turn to our guest, Selwyn Hart. Uh, Please let me know uh, whether you have any hands raised in uh, the chat function, and then we can uh, take some questions before we turn to Selwyn. Let's go to chat. Hold on one second, please. Um, Okay, uh, uh, I I have a note from James Reinald saying that he couldn't hear me. I hope you can hear now. And I have a question from Stefano Vacada. Stefano, you're on. Thank you very much, Farhan. Is uh, again uh, the same question of yesterday about the um, investigation on uh, Mario Pachola's death in Colombia. I asked you yesterday if you had any news about the, um, um, uh, you know, the autopsy, whatever is that, uh, ha- come up with the investigation, because it's been a very, very hard to find information. I wrote and. My colleague have been written to, uh, we, we wrote to the, to the mission there in Colombia, but we didn't, uh, we received uh, some, uh, uh, an email uh, last week, the last week, but we didn't receive any more anything. So we would like to know if you have any update or what you are doing to find out more that you can share with us. Thank you. Well, at this stage, uh, I don't have anything further to what I told you yesterday. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the, the mission in Colombia has expressed uh, its condolences to his family, and they've also uh, uh, said that they are looking into the situation. Uh, We are aware, of course, that the Colombian authorities uh, are looking into this, and uh, and our mission is in touch with them. So that's where we stand, and if we have any further updates down the line, I'll let you know at that point. Uh, Okay, uh, Abdel Hamid, you have a question. Thank you, Farhan. Uh... Recently, the Syrian government declared that it is rezoning the Yarmouk refugee camp to be part of Damascus. So I want to ask if UNRWA was notified, if you have any uh, news about that, and if you don't, could you please ask this question, if UNRWA was consulted, and this which will abolish the Yarmouk refugee camp and disperse 250,000 Palestinian refugees from the area. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any information uh, so far from the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, about this, but I I will check with them and see whether they have anything. Uh, And with that, uh, Toby from NHK, you're on. Hi there, Farhan. Can you hear me? Uh, Yes, I can. Uh, I just wanted to ask regarding Yemen. You said that... uh, the the mission there is waiting for permissions from uh, the authorities to get onto the Safar uh, oil tanker. What what are those uh, particular permissions? What what needs to happen uh, for the next steps to take place? Thank you. Uh, I believe that Mr. Lowcock, uh, both in his briefing today and in his briefing last month, uh, discussed uh, somewhat at length uh, the difference between the um, the initial oral and written uh, permissions we've gotten sometimes and and the actual paperwork that we would need to make sure that, uh, that our personnel could get to areas. Uh, this has happened in the past. Uh, he expressed his hope uh, today to the Security Council uh, that we don't have uh, 
uh, any similar difficulties as we faced in the past uh, this time around, because uh, we do believe that uh, we are at a very serious point uh, in terms of the safety of this vessel. Um, but uh, both Mr. Griffiths and Mr. Lowcock did point out that uh, that uh, we will continue to need uh, uh, the follow-up paperwork and permissions. Um, and so we're working on that. We don't have it yet. Uh, as we explained uh, a few weeks ago, we expect uh, the deployment uh, to proceed within about three weeks once we have the permissions we need, but we're not there yet. Okay. And... Um, I have also another question. Okay, sure. Back to you then. Thank you, Farhan. On July 20th, the Israeli occupation authorities came to the village of Tabkor next to Bethlehem. And in midday, they stole a huge stone, which is from the Byzantine uh, period. It used, it used to be used for baptizing and took it in the midday, in the midday robbery. So I want to ask also this question to UNESCO, if it is aware of this tip of a Palestinian uh, historic stone, which weighs seven tons. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for saying. Uh, I'll leave it, of course, to my colleagues in the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, uh, to deal with any issues. At this stage, uh, they have not uh, made any comments on this. And uh, with that, uh, if Selwyn Hart is ready, I will turn the floor over to him. Uh, thank